Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Mortgage Lab video for this week. Uh, today we're talking to Gareth Collard from Epsom Tax and the reason we've uh, asked Gareth to join us is because there's some huge changes from the 1st of October 2021, which as of the time of recording is tomorrow or the next day. And, uh, and so we just want to talk and update our viewers on uh, some of the changes that are happening and of course some of the proposed changes which aren't set in concrete yet. Uh, so Gareth, thanks for joining us. Nice to be with you today. Cool. So uh, obviously big changes in uh, was it February or March, the government announced related to the tax deductibility of interest costs with mortgages. Um, just can you give us a bit of an overview of what happened back then? Yeah, sure. So it was um, probably the, the biggest bombshell in quite a while because you know, every business can borrow money and uh, claim the interest. And that's a connection between what well, we're earning income, we, we need money to fund it till we claim the interest. And so the government said that they would uh, allow that to continue for every business under the sun except if you had an existing rental property. Um, now that had been framed as um, a loophole. Um, it's a, a, an interesting comment. <laughs> yeah. um, it seems to be an un inconsistent tax treatment of just a particular kind of, of, uh, uh, of interest. But then they went on to explain why they want more houses built and they're you know, trying to you know, push uh, private investors into that. So, you, okay, you, you can understand, use use um, policy, use laws to enforce policy. Um, the rightness or wrongness on that, I'm not going to get into that, but it was a big, certainly a really big change. I remember thinking it was probably, I mean, we've seen LVRs and you're threatened with um, so loan to value ratios, and you're threatened with debt to income ratios. And I remember when that bombshell dropped, I remember thinking this is going to be the thing that really uh, puts the brakes on the market, which is on the market, which is essentially what they were trying to do, right? They they had a runaway property market, yeah. uh, and they were trying to take a particular portion out, um, as you say, rightly or wrongly, whether they should have targeted the investors um, as a as another thing, but that was specifically what it was to do. Yeah, yeah. And just as a thought, uh, the IAD have come out and said we don't agree with this, um, you know, in their public statement. So. Uh, it, Government is not united on this, and the main agency tasked with tax gathering and administration says we we disagree strongly. <laughs> you know, enough that they put a statement out to that effect, which I thought was interesting. Um, by the way, that is it's not alcohol; that's um, a cup. You know, that is it's coffee. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we, can all, we can all wet our yeah wet our yeah. It's, so it's, not, <laughs> it's not that. And interestingly enough, yes, we did. I think probably all wondered is will this be the death knell? For property investors, but actually, you know what? Um, it's it's pretty much business as, as usual. It's mortgage advisors and, and lawyers and accountants. We okay, well, let's look, you know find ways around this, etc., and um, yeah. and so forth. That's certainly. I mean, no government wants to crash the market, right? So that would be that would have been their goal is just to hey, everyone, take a step and think about, you know, is, is this the next right move? Uh, uh, so uh, to move on to the the. The rules that are coming out on the first of October, particularly, um, we're going to we're going to talk about a lot of them. But um, uh, for now, around new build uh, um, properties, because this is a really interesting. Uh, what's going to happen to the market is going to be really interesting in the next six months as a result of it. So um, you're going to put this a lot better than I am. But essentially, the um, the interest on mortgages is still deductible if the property meets the criteria for a new build. And that's what they've just released, right? Mm, yeah, that's right. And there was a couple of pleasant, pleasant surprises, really, in this, you know, coming through. Um, it's it, it, Mostly it is sort of like being given a bouquet composed of rotting sardines. But the nice thing was, is there were a few, <laughs> there's a few roses in amongst that you need to pick out and pull the... Um, the muck off those and go, oh, it's a word. So <laughs> they, they put glitter on the sardines. Is that <laughs> the bouquet of sardines? Yeah. You love yeah. glittered sardines. Yeah. So um, some and some of the glitter, I guess, was uh, that the these interest concessions on um, new builds will be 20 years. 
uh, which is amazing. You know, I was thinking we just five years force people to sell, rinse and repeat, you know, but 20 years and subsequent buyers will also be able to benefit from that. So that's pretty good. Uh, and the other thing was, which um, I think we all thought was a, a typo in the Herald, was that, um, you know, it's, I'll read it from a new build will be a self-contained residence that gets a CCC uh, Council Code of Compliance. Confirming the residence was added to the land on or after 27th March 2020, mm. not 2021. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so last year. So this is huge. And I do wonder if this is a bit of pushback from like, oh, okay, we probably went too hard. We just have to pull it back a bit. Um, be, you know, and, and there'll always be somebody that loses. It'll be the person who got the CCC on the 26th 26. of March 2020. <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I have a feeling that's why they did that, right? Because they announced these rules. And if you just bought a new build house, if you'd settled in the end of February, you know, you, you were cut out and you'd, you'd had the intention to buy this new build house. So I, I think that's probably why they dealt it back again. As you say, there'll always be that person who, who did it the day before and that, that they may be reassessing their, um, their ownership of that property. But mm. it's, it is good that they they pushed it back a, a little bit. That the twenty years of of tax, we just call it tax exemption, or ta uh, you know, yeah. uh, I guess interest deduct deductibility. Yeah. Yes. That I would not have put good money on twenty years uh, mm. on them being that lenient. So yeah, they they are they are giving with one hand and taking with another. But at least is yeah. And, and sub, I I wasn't very clear on the articles that I read on whether it was one subsequent owner or all subsequent owners from from um, 2021. And it may not be very clear in the, in the things that they've... Yeah. Um, one subsequent or multiple. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know either, actually. Um, it's... It, because the article it, it, had stage. an example where um, yeah, if that person on sold it, that next person would be uh, would still have those tax deductible, you know, interest costs. Mm. But it, it it wasn't really sure. It wasn't really clear whether it was that person or all for twenty years. But yeah, well, we'll see. That, that, that those yeah. sort of things will come clear for sure. Yeah, and and always when laws are passed, even when they're done with lots of time and lots of thought, they usually spend several years uh, undoing unintended consequences um and i might if i may i might actually just touch on one unintended consequence it's taken some years to undo but they've finally got here do it um and this is uh when you change ownership uh of something like sell it from your trust to your ltc etc or vice versa um but it, it resets everything and, and now you're caught for 10 years again with the bite line um can we touch on that while we're on the subject, Rupert? Yeah, uh, because I know I, I know we've we've had clients um, that that have had this happen to them, where you know they they wanted to make their uh, rental properties tax efficient by putting them in the right uh, vehicle. Something happens a couple of years down the road, and they're stung by that bright line for just being you know for just doing good things with their accounts, right? And yeah, mm -hmm. so so please yeah expand on that if you can. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's been referred to as rollover relief, so a technical change of ownership. So what they're saying is this will not affect the bright line property rule. So uh, previously, let's say that you um, you owned a house, uh, you looked through a company, owned a house, and actually you've got a client in this situation, um, the land next door, that, okay, they bought that and uh, bought with a look through company and, oh, we'll build a rental. Actually, you know what, we... Uh, we'll move into this, this new house ourselves. And, oh, but now we don't really want to live in this house that's owned by our LTC. Now, if you move that out and say into the family trust or whatever, because it's kind of never a great thing to have your, your family home in a, in a look through company, um, it would reset the bright line test and you know yeah, you could end up sort of with some nasty consequences from it. But it, it makes the comment, uh, I'm sure enough the screen from uh, IAD, the original owner will not be taxed on the realized gain on the property. And the new owner will be treated as having acquired the land when it was acquired by the original owner. So in other words, provided the right hoops to jump through, if there's these change of ownerships between um, entities like this, where the underlying ownership is basically the same, essentially it's just one steps into the shoes of the other. It's viewed as if there was no change. 
something similar is done when there's uh, a relationship property um, settlement and uh, one partner buys the other out. So at the end of a relationship, uh, they're viewed as sort of stepping into um, the shoes of the original owner. So it's the same sort of concept but applied here. It says it's for, it applies for some transfers to family trusts and for transfers to or from look through companies and partnerships. Um, I mean, it's yeah, within the spirit of the bright line test, right? And that you have owned that property, sure, mm. it's, it was in your personal name, now it's in a trust, but you're not flicking houses every two years, or you're not you're not jumping houses every two years. Yeah. So I, I I think that's really good. How they monitor that will be interesting, uh, and you, you may have some insight into that. But um, you, you know, if, if I own a house personally, and then I move it to the trust that has a trustee of myself and my wife, I don't know if that would be a material change. And does it does it go into that or? Yeah, th this is a thing that I'll be interested to see. Is um, you know. How's it going to work in practice? Uh, because trusts, for example, often have a professional trustee. Well, we assume that they would be ex excluded for the purposes of this. But you're right. Um, maybe uh, you have that situation, or I'd set up a trust, and then later you, you get married, and, oh, now my wife's not actually in the trust yet, and we hadn't done that because of blah, blah, blah. Will this then be seen as a, a real change of ownership? Or will they apply maybe the associated person's test that, you know, if you're within two degrees, it's sort of considered that they're all associated. So it is something it'll be proceed with caution because get it wrong and bang, you know, you hit with tax. <laughs> yeah. Um, and quite smacked, a bit of tax, right? Yeah. Right. You're smacked with a glitter covered sardine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, nothing can be done before 1 April 2022. So it's uh, that's it's uh, any transfers after that date. So they're allowing time to work out the details etc i'd say this would be real proceed with caution very promising but very much all eyes must be dotted and t's crossed otherwise you'll end up with eyes crossed mm. <laughs> that's right mm. yeah yeah i um so, so you've got a list of something now we don't say tax avoidance around here but uh, how how could people retain their interest deductions um on their property because it's, it's a few scenarios right yeah this this true uh so uh, one scenario is where if your property is rented or leased to a social housing housing provider so that, that could be like kind aurora um or a, a registered community housing provider so not everybody has traditionally been as keen necessarily to do that because they worry about uh will their property be looked after um, generally, you know, it's often like a five-year contract or whatever anyway, and then the provider get, just gives the thing a whole refresh at the end. Mm. Um, however, this is one where if your property is rented or leased to, to one of these uh, providers, you can still claim the interest deductions. So that, that now makes it very attractive uh, compared to, you know, your existing scenario where your rent's going to be whittled away over the next three, four years to zero percent claim on the interest, but you're still going to keep paying it, right? Um, I, I think, uh, and given that those providers, those community housing providers tend to pay above the market, I think some people may find themselves a bit more community spirited <laughs> in the future. Yeah, look, and, and honestly, it's like, um, great, you know, you, you can uh, feel good about it. It's interesting that the depiction has been of property investors as this bunch of, you know, bloating evil landlords you know uh, and and maybe there are some people out there like that but i haven't actually met any in, no. in, in my years you know the, the average property investor that we're dealing with is maybe mum and dad and they're both working there's a kid or two perhaps and they're just trying to do something for their retirement and um uh, my clock's just going to chime in, in the background which wants to throw its piece in there, there you go. um 30 everybody <laughs> Yeah, it's 2.30, yeah, uh, <laughs> somewhere. And so, you know, and that's kind of a bit of, okay, I'm not going to rely on the government to look after me in my old age. I'm going to be uh, responsible. I've got the ability to do that. Not everybody has. So let's see if I can can do this for, for, for my family. And, and then as a result, yes, they're providing a house to somebody who can't afford it at this point in time. So it's we, we struggle to see that it's ever been an irresponsible, evil um thing to do mm. right to to uh, to be a landlord 
Um, so feel good about that, I would say, as a property investor. And, and I think most people get it. They want their tenants to be happy, to be healthy, to be warm. That then they look after the property. You know, it's not all like this. No. Um, and so social housing then is now even more so firmly within that arena. You know, you, there's a nice social conscience aspect to it. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. What's the uh, what's the next? What else? What's on situation? the board, Miss Ford? I'm showing my age there. Um, <laughs> So, you know, obviously, if your property is commercial or a farm, uh, that's exempt from that. Uh, new builds, as we've you know, just been talking about. So five-year bright line interest deductions for 20 years, um, so long as you get your CCC uh, on or after 27th March 2020. So Indeed. that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, if you've got property overseas, <laughs> rental property, so there's never been a better time. We should have teed something up with like a real estate agent in Queensland here. There's never been a better time to buy a rental property on the sunny Gold Coast um, because you're going to be able to claim all of that interest there. That's a, that is an interesting one. So that is for mortgages that are um, uh, located in, with New Zealand banks, so secured against New Zealand properties, but for the purpose of purchasing property overseas. Would be my guess yeah, so the, the bright line still does affect overseas property, mm. right? So you buy one and it's, if you bought one now, it's a 10-year bright line test and, you know, New Zealand taxes you only worldwide income. So that doesn't change that set of rules. But I guess that it's probably in the too hard basket. Um, and, the, and the problem with housing is here. So perhaps to try and then control interest deductibility on a rental that you might own overseas, perhaps has been seen as overreach. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, potentially, you know, if you're, if you're claiming tax on, on this overseas property, you have to then declare it to the IRD and so they get an insight into when you own it and when you don't. But yeah. Yeah. Think... And of course, owning property in another country brings its own set of tax hurdles as well. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and especially with, um, yeah, this is more your area of expertise, Rupert, but, you know, borrowing to buy property in another country and how the different banks view that so even just between here and australia yeah uh, they're all related but it's um they, they it's don't not cross easy. No, yeah. you've got to, you can only give new zealand properties to new zealand banks it's um, mm. it's very tricky so it, it's pretty mm. tricky i mean we we do have clients with properties overseas uh and um a lot of that's in australia but it's just, it's not common i think because of the challenges so it's not necessarily oh great we'll just go and yeah, um, <laughs> if you yeah. Ha haven't got some sort of pre-approval or the finance or whatever to do that implicitly for that overseas property, it's I don't think it's going to be an easy pass. Mm, mm. Yeah, plus cool. local accountant over there, um, taxation, blah blah blah. But anyway, it, it is it's another exclusion. Um, your your own property, of course, if that's your main home, maybe you've got uh, flatmates uh, or borders. Well, they're going to allow interest deductions in those situations. Oh. This, this is interesting, right, because um, I don't know what percentage of people would uh, uh, disclose their income for the, for the flat maiden borders. Um, and, yeah, it's an uh, interesting Wrongly, yeah. don't hide your income. Uh, mm. But I, I suspect uh, some people forget to do that, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Look, and I think in, in all the years we've been practicing, it, it's I could count... Um, on one hand and still have a couple of fingers of people who are actually trying to rort things. You know, um, the population are pretty darn honest. Mm. You know, hey, we want to save yeah. money. But I think people realize, um, and there's a little bit of stick, uh, you know, not just carrot probably with that, but um, that they want to do the right thing. There are, you know, situations like if you're, you're border, it's, um, it's about 185, 190 bucks a week at the moment, something like that. You don't have to declare it. They're not, mm. you know, idea and interested, don't claim any expenses either. So there are certain cutoffs, but of course, if you've got flatmates, there's no, there's no non-declaration threshold. It, mm. It's got to be declared. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at least, hey, great, you can still keep claiming the interest, which is fantastic. That's right. Probably offsets yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other things that we would mention uh, would be, you know, if you, you're developing uh, a property, um, you know, that sort of thing, because generally a property developer is going to be paying tax on the property anyway yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they sell it. Um, 
if you are selling the property and it's going to be taxable gain, well, then there's, um, you save up your interest deductions and then you can claim the when the property sold. Mm. So it becomes a, something to reduce your tax, uh, which is nice. Um, and also uh, one more situation is um, it, I do look at the purpose of the borrowing. So if you uh, own a house and you own a business and you borrowed some money for the business, but it's secured over the house, it's business uh, loans. It's not residential rental loans. So you're still going to be able to deduct the interest just like you always would on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough too, right? It's, it's you know if I've if I've raised money to for, for mortgage lab, then it was it was for a business expense, and so you know. yeah, yeah, for sure. And then there's a few other sort of little uh, tricky situations, but it just sort of gets harder and harder to to jump through the hoops, and sometimes the complications don't really justify the results. What we're seeing is most people is heading towards new builds. Um, and like we've said before, a lot of our clients have got a couple of years before that they're really going to feel anything from the new laws anyway. So there's time to gradually exit. And you know, we're saying go where the money is. You know, new builds great, fantastic. I get that, feel good about it. Yeah. It's probably a good timeline, right? Because if they were looking at a new build right now, that's probably going to be ready in 12 to 18 months. So they, they can think about that. They can prepare themselves. If they're going to change properties, if they're going to sell their existing properties, then uh, they're, you know, they're going, they're going to uh, just um, have time to plan for that. Yeah. 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 One thing I might just highlight, uh, if I may, Rupert, is just the start of the bright line test when you're buying off the plants. Yes, um, because this is another significant advantage of the new bill. We haven't seen this really broadcast uh, in the news, but um, you know, the, the date of acquisition uh, under Brightline, if you're buying off the plans, no title issued, is when you sign the sale and purchase date. So that could be a year or more uh, before the house uh, is actually complete and gets its code of compliance. So let's say it is a year, you sign the contract and, you know, takes a while as you're COVID lockdown and there's not enough wood and you know, blah, blah, blah. And maybe it's 18 months. You're already 18 months into your five-year period anyway. Mm. Uh, the house has gone up in value. Whereas if you buy an existing house, the bright line test start date is not that. It's not settlement. It's when the transfer takes place at Land Information New Zealand. So it's a very late start date. Yeah. So this is another bonus and obviously, there's a few gotchas with buying off the plans, no title issued, which uh, one, the mortgage side of things. Uh, a little more difficult. About that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the whole build contract thing, which is, you know, around your lawyer and often while we're saying to people, you know, turnkey is perhaps more expensive, but safer in terms of blocking down costs. But, mm. you know, there's lots of pluses for, for new builds. Um that are uh, you know, going on there. That's amazing. I mean, if it's an apartment block, it's easily 18 months. It's, it could be over two years because there's a lot to do in an apartment block. And and um, you're paying at today's price. You've only released 10% of the purchase price. You're not paying any interest on the rest of the borrowing because the rest of the money comes when you settle. You're ticking off, your, you're eating into your bright line, which is half of what it would have been Am I right? On existing, yeah. so 10, yeah. 10 on existing, five on new. I mean, they have really stacked the deck for uh, new builds, haven't they? Yeah. Um, so that is sort of a win-win-win. But my, my concern that I, I'm interested in is I've read these things about where you know people get the pre-approval and the pre-approval expires, and now they have to pay the, the other 90% or whatever on their new build, but now they can't get approval. Um I don't know because someone's on maternity leave. Yeah, is is that a thing, or does this come down yeah. to just deal with a good mortgage advisor, like the mortgage lab, and <laughs> there's no problem? You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is. It is a thing. Um, yes, it, it is actually as you mentioned it. So um, uh, typically. Uh, pre-approvals last for 12 months and very little can be built within 12 months unless they're um, as efficient developers. So there is a problem when that comes to renew. If the financial circumstances, as you say, nothing, nothing um, bad, just uh, they, they've gone on maternity leave or you know they're, they're in between a job. Um, what we tend to do is take a, 
a solid guess at when we think it's going to settle. Uh, so let's say it's eight months away. So we typically want to renew the pre-approval eight months before the estimated settlement. If something's wrong, we've got eight months to try and fix it, uh, as in mum can go back to work or you can find a new job. Uh, if, um, if the settlement is delayed, we've got four months there with a 12 month pre-approval um, has a bit of flexible flexibility. And if all else goes wrong, we've got eight months to find another buyer for that property or negotiate with the developer to retract the contract, which usually they're happy to do because the property's gone up by about $8,000 million, you know? So, uh, um, uh, so yeah, th there is that risk with, and that mm. you aren't pre-approved for the settlement date because no bank will give you a pre-approval for that long. And mm. it's it's not that they're being difficult. They they have to hold that money for a pre-approval. So if they had, you know, if you went to three banks and got pre-approval for a million dollars, they have to have that money ready for the day that you turn up and say, give me my million dollars. So um, taking it longer than 12 months is, is a burden on the banks. And also mm. they want to know that, you know, if, if things have changed significantly in those, in those 12 months, what they're risking for. Now we have had a couple of uh, situations where a bank, where um, a, a person has lost their job for a variety of reasons. The banks don't pull the rug out by default. They, they don't want you to lose your $100,000 deposit. They really do work with you to get. And, and it might be that you say, look, I've got $20,000 of savings and that will cover the shortfall when I have to settle on my mortgage until I can find a job. Um, that they don't by default pull the rug out from underneath mm -hmm. you. So, um, but it is something to think about when you're signing up for a turnkey is what could change in the next uh, two years. Mm. Mm. So it sounds like really it is a key thing. If your mortgage advisor is onto it, uh, then that's that's really going to minimise risk then in the scenario. So there's yeah. kind of win, 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 a bit of a beware of this, but most of it is actually pretty sunny when thinking about new bills. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't leave it to until two months before, a month before settlement, because that is too late to find a solution would be, yeah. would be the, the outcome of that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. um, uh, just maybe um, because there are some quirky little things in terms of uh, extensions on current properties and changes to existing properties to increase the number of dwellings um, for new builds. Have you, have you sort of got a mind over that? Yeah, so um, they have you know, come and said like, you know, essentially if you have turned one house into two, is that a new build? Uh, and the answer is, is yes, you know, two or three or whatever, because you're creating a new dwelling. It would, I imagine, have to get at CCC. Yep. To, you know, it's still got to jump through that hoop. The existing dwelling is not the new bill, but you know the the, the new portion issued. So that would suggest that, say, you've got a house uh, that you live in, and you can now put self-contained. It's got to be fully self-contained, mind you, uh, flat on that. Get your CCC. There you go. That's a new bill. So because you are now adding another property to the market that was not uh, previously available. So I think that's probably quite a good scope also for investors to look at their own home and think, oh, I wonder if we could do something here, you know, because now you've got that, uh, that thing of being able to claim the interest. Uh, and presumably with the, 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 if you sold that subsequently, um, then also the next buyer is going to be able to continue to claim that. Is, so is that um, is that deductible on the whole mortgage or on the percentage of the house that is covered by the new dwelling? Or it, it would just be the 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 portion that's for the new build. Mm. So you know, say you had a um, a million dollar home. Here we go again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you had a million dollar home, and you spend five hundred thousand dollars on uh, the new build portion. Then my understanding is that the five hundred thousand dollar mortgage um, would be uh, interest deductible yeah. on your main home you're not claiming that interest anyway because you, you live there so it's yeah. never was deductible um, unless you know maybe you're claiming some home office etc for for your business etc mm -hmm. so it's really what's the, the the id buzzword is nexus you know which is to the rest of us is connection what's the connection between the borrowing and the claim so yep. there is a connection here under these new build rules. 
Yeah. The first home I ever bought was uh, pitched as a home in Inca. This was before our real estate agents needed to um, actually back up the ads that they put in. And you walked along a hallway and uh, walked down the stairs and just came to a bit of jib where the... <laughs> <laughs> they just walled off the uh, downstairs bit and they called it a, a home and income. I know I'd suggest that would not count, but mainly because it doesn't cover by insurance <laughs> <laughs> these days, but uh, but also not consented. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I think it, it's definitely another, uh, I mean, we didn't mention that just before in terms of things, but it's definitely something worth looking at uh, as, as a homeowner because you are adding value to your asset. Um, not obviously not all properties are going to lend themselves to that. One thing to think about is you know, if you're on a cross lease, right, then you've got to get permission from your neighbours, the other owner of the cross lease, to do this sort of major stuff. Maybe that's a good time to bite the bullet and get the, uh, your own title. Now, mm. that cost is, is going to be capital cost, i.e. not tax deductible, but it does fix the problem of getting permission from the neighbour and it's just increased the value of your house anyway. And in the big scheme, if you're borrowing, if you got the approval to it, maybe another, I don't know, 15, 20, 25, depending how complex it is, might be 50 grand to get your um, your title. That may not be a huge cost proportionate to, you know, this new build self-contained dwelling that you're going to add to your property. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Anything else to add before we wrap up? Um. I think sort of the, 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 it's, it's, the thing is probably um, some things are very clear and, and that is the, the new build stuff is very clear what's going to be okay. So I feel that people can, uh, with confidence, be purchasing new builds. Some of these other situations, there is a little bit of grey or there's still not a lot of detail. So it would be proceed with caution uh, or get an opinion in writing right, from um, an accountant who, who specialises in this sort of thing. Um, like Epsom tax, for example. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I was going to say that, actually, I think the, the days of doing your own rental property accounts because it was just, you know, your, your income in and your rates out, they're gone, right? But making a mistake these days is you're talking tens of thousands of dollars yeah. yeah, it's a fair comment. Look, and it, it's, it probably is self-serving, but I, in all honesty... I That's why I said of, it, not you. <laughs> yeah, I look at the amount of training that we've had to give our staff in the last two years who are already experienced mm -hmm. in doing this stuff with how to make sure this translates from your financials onto your, um, your personal tax returns and preserving things you know, like is it portfolio approach or is it individual, et cetera, tracking that all through uh, and in the right boxes. No, this loss goes here, but that loss must go there. Um, that stuff is easy to get mixed up. And look, IND are usually pretty tolerant of it, but not always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. and we just dealt with a situation this week where somebody had gone on and amended their tax return, and then IID have come back and asked a whole bunch of questions. We said, um, you might need to get us to handle that, just see how it goes. But uh, it's going on a little bit of an alarming path. Honest mistakes, mm. but it's ringing alarm bells at IRD, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, why did you change this? Why did you move that from there to there? And, you know, blah, blah. And mm. then I think so this new layer of stuff that's come in this year is just uh, in terms of, yes, you can claim this much interest and then this much and then this much. And, and these various other things that keep getting laid on, you're right, it's got a lot more complex than it used to be in the old days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. On that note, thanks uh, Thanks for joining us. Thanks. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, so Gareth Clyde from Epsom Tax, uh, uh, epsomtax.com. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and so have a look on there. If it, anything to do with rental properties, uh, the accounts around that, make sure you talk to them. But thanks, Gareth, for uh, coming in and filling us in. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Rupert.